Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. Where the tyrant has officially run out of friends. With the Lamentors defeated by the Minotaurs, the Mantis Warriors driven into hiding by the Carcaradons, and now the Executioners turned against the Astral Claws by the dishonorable actions of an Astral Claws Centurion. Luft Huron and his legion stands alone against an ever-growing number of enemies. It was time for a consolidation, a change in government, and theology in particular. On a semi-similar note, by the way, if you wonder where all of the other stuff on the channel has gone, I have moved all of the non-lore-related activities over onto a second channel. The older videos have been made private for the time being until I can figure out exactly what to do with it. YouTube Terms of Service makes having unguarded gameplay, shall we say, a a hazardous affair in this day and age. So this channel will concern itself exclusively with Warhammer and 40k, a little bit of Starship Troopers and lore in general, and perhaps the occasional commentary on the hobby as well. I did see some of the new models announced, for example, and maybe I'm just getting old, but god damn it, some of them look hideous, in my opinion, to the point where I don't even know what the hell they're supposed to be representing anymore. But that's a gripe for another time. If you're interested, the link to the second channel will be in the channel description down below. Now, Lefthuron had seen the last of his allies not merely just leave him, but betray him and actively begin to strike out against those few remnants of Astral Claw's power and authority outside of the Badab sector. This pushed him finally and irreversibly over the edge. He held a massive speech broadcast to the entirety of the Badab sector and beyond, where he utterly and completely condemned the bankrupt rotting carcass fit only for the grave that was the Imperium of Man, a cantankerous growth that seemingly existed only to condemn what remained of humanity's true strength and he announced that Badab would become the beating heart of a new Imperium, dedicated purely to the survival and the triumph of mankind. With the speech concluding with the words, The strong are strongest alone. Now, if this was the early 2000s, I'd be putting in a certain South Park clip here, mentioning a mighty faggot, but... We are long past the good old days, so we shall simply just continue on. Luft Huron ordered an extensive program of destruction to be carried out not just on Badab Primaris, but throughout the Badab sector. All icons representative of the Imperium or the Imperial Faith was to be destroyed. Aquilas and Cathedral both would be torn down and demolished by explosive charges. Every sign of the Imperium or of Imperial administration was to be removed forevermore from the Badab sector. This radical process of decolonialization I couldn't resist culminated in the mass execution and slaughter of all administratum personnel and clergy members. It may at first seem somewhat baffling that there would be any of these left in the Badab sector, but remember the tyrant had an absolute grasp of anything and everything that went on within his space. Information, news, opinions, and all forms of freedoms were, of course, heavily policed and regulated. And those members of the imperial administrative branches and the clergy who were within the Badab sector and the wider autonomous zone when hostilities broke out 
were simply informed that this was yet another war waged by the warders against the heretical scum and filth flooding out of the maelstrom. The warders were not fighting fellow imperial servants, of course not. That would be absurd. The border war against Carthago had, after all, already successfully concluded with a warder's victory, don't you know? But with the borders of the Badab system itself now under assault by the loyalists, the truth was no longer possible to disguise, and so stricter measures were necessary. And it was not just the ranks of the ecclesiarchy and the administratum that felt the scythe of the tyrant censor, it was also the ranks of the once glorious tyrant's legion. The imperial guard equivalent army that he had built to protect his domain, and that had proven so steadfast and so exceptional in their service and bravery as to give even the Red Scorpions pause. But recruited from amongst the populace of the Autonomous Zone, they too were loyal citizens, who had been convinced by the Astral Clause that they were fighting heresy as usual. In void warfare, this is hardly a difficult ruse to pull off, as the crew will never even see the ship they're firing at, much less so the crew. In ground battles, it gets a little bit more difficult, but adequate numbers of commissar equivalents can make it dangerous to ask any questions. Repeated engagements with the God Emperor's own Astartes, however, had been chipping away at the morale of the Tyrant's Legion for quite some time. Additionally, they had suffered extensive casualties throughout the war, as they had often been made to bear the brunt of the fighting, as their Astartes masters were always severely outnumbered by the heretical traitors from outside the Autonomous Zone. What remained of the Legion now was a mere shadow of itself, and as Lufthuron swung the scythe through its ranks, decapitating anyone whose loyalty might be questioned, or who had learned too much in the preceding years of the conflict, finally reduced the shadow to the merest spectre. It was still a significant fighting force, equipped with its own armoured division, artillery units, and still some fanatically loyal personnel. But the leadership, the discipline, and the genuine belief in that they were doing the right thing protecting their homes that allowed the Legion to stand up straight in the face of even the Red Scorpion's wrath was long gone. And perhaps that was for the best. The men that had spent their lives, their blood, their tears, and their sweat defending the Autonomous Zone in the name of their worthy masters, the Astral Claws, would not have liked to see what those self-same masters had now become. Lufthuron's tyranny had only just begun. The Astral Claws had been an honourable fighting force. They had thought they were doing the right thing in protecting the Autonomous Zone, in upholding their ancient rights. And they had treated the people of the Autonomous Zone quite generously. The Tyrant's rule was strict, no doubt about that, but it was also orderly and merciful in its own way. This was an area of space constantly riven with pirate activity, with raids, with marauding orc warbands of strife, of heresy, and constant danger. The tyrant's rules may be harsh, but they were fair, applied evenly to all social stratas and to all imperial servants within the Autonomous Zone, and they provided safety security, prosperity, and stability to the populace. But as the Claws grew ever more desperate, 
they began to view the populace quite differently. They were no longer citizens of their little empire. They were now resources, cogs in a machine, to be expended at the astral claws, pleasure and will. They were nothing more than so many rounds of munition that could be used to make the darned loyalists pay for every meter they took of the Badab Primaris Sector. This callous, if some might say realistic view, and let's be honest here, there are plenty for loyalist chapters as well that has on occasion viewed imperial citizenry as little more than extra bodies, uh, quickly began transforming the astral claws. They were surrounded, without any friends, without any hope of victory, nor even now of any sort of negotiated peace. They were all dead men walking, and they knew it. This kind of bitterness fostered a vicious sort of supremacist mentality in the Astral Claw's minds. What was once concern for the citizenry turned into a rationalistic appreciation of their potential to hinder their foes, and that in turn turned into a sort of disregard at first, and then slowly but surely, loathing, hatred. Why were the astral claws bleeding for these soppy, crying, ungrateful meat bags um, with their administratum, with their ecclesiarchy, with their worship of an imperium and an emperor now proven patently false. At first it became illegal for any non astartes personnel to enter the palace of thorns, after a supposed assassination attempt against Luft Huron. After that, it became illegal for normal humans to even look upon the Astral Claws, on pain of being blinded on the spot by the Astartes they had so rudely offended. And it was not merely in their opinions of the finer point of Imperial law either that the Astral Claws were changing. In fact, that name the Astral Claws were falling more and more out of favour. The traditional blues and silver of their colours also slowly but surely beginning to fade out as well. At first, single pieces of armour plating was replaced with bright red, a shoulder pad, a greave, a gauntlet to symbolize the chapter's vows of vengeance against those who had wronged them. Then their symbol, the golden tiger's head, also began disappearing more and more, to be replaced almost entirely by the tyrant's claw. And frequently, although not universally, these new icons and decorations took the place of all the imperial insignia. Aquilas were removed from armor and replaced with the claw. The insignia of apothecaries, of a handful of chaplains and librarians that remained replaced with the new red of vengeance. And of course, the less immediately visually obvious changes. The Astartes were becoming more ragged, more feral. They eschewed the usual command structure of the Codex Astartes, and formed more and more around individual charismatic leaders in de facto warbands. Though, before you read too much into that word, allow me to also make something clear. There is still no real indication that Luft Huron or the Astral Claws had engaged in any openly chaotic heresy, shall we say. <laughs> heresy beyond the usual form, if you get my drift. <laughs> 
the reorganization into a more loosely tied together command structure may very well simply have been a strategic choice since the tyrant would have known full well that once the loyalists began moving into the Badab sector, lines of communication would grow complicated awfully quickly, as the loyalists were expected to be able to maintain complete void superiority as the secessionist fleet now was but a handful of relatively light vessels. It seemed as if the tyrant would have no choice but to passively await the arrival of the Loyalists and then fight a defensive siege-style battle. This was also the interpretation of Lord Militant Commander Carab Cullen, whom, after having waited as long as he thought strategically advisable, and after having resolved the threat to his rearward lines, ordered the advance into the Badab sector to begin, with the initial target being the system of Piraeus, a small yet well-developed system on the outskirts of the sector, commanding the most stable warp routes leading to Badab Primaris itself. The campaign had already gone on for too long, and Cullen was eager to seek any potential advantage that could end the war swiftly. There were other advantages in attacking the Piraeus system as well, Firstly, amongst them was the considerable orbital shipyards centered around the gas giant Criteus. Taking control over these facilities would solve one of Carab Cullen's most pressing issues. The need to constantly resupply, rearm, repair and rest his now massive naval assets which would allow him to impose the kind of large-scale blockade and absolute void superiority over the Badab system that he was intending to carry out. It would be not merely a desired reality, but an absolutely necessary one if he was to end the war swiftly by heading towards Badab Primaris. If the tyrant was able to repeat his previous actions of focusing reinforcements into the Badab system, now in a smaller scale to Badab Primaris itself, then the planet would become a much tougher objective. But by establishing maintenance yards and resupply points within the Badab sector, Carab Cullen might just be able to throw a complete blanket of suppression of the whole sector, interdicting and preventing all strategic movement towards Badab Primaris. Perhaps he would even be so lucky as to find that the tyrant had scattered much of his forces in the outlying systems, his pride dictating that the enemy not be allowed to take one step into the system at all. The Lord of the Red Scorpions had already taken actions to try to encourage this line of thinking, with the Minotaurs, Exorcists and Red Scorpions chapters all launching repeated raids against the outskirts of the Badab sector. Intended to unbalance the tyrant, confuse him as to where the real attack would come, and also to humiliate him, to demonstrate that he was not able to defend even this small portion of his empire, and thusly encourage him to try to do just that. Whilst the loyalist forces were amassing for a move into the Prius system, the plan called for initial assault by the Imperial Navy against the world of Piraeus V, or Yarrow Station as the locals referred to it. This was an industrial world, not a large-scale forge world, but one that produced a great deal of the locally refined materiel, and was also responsible for supplying the naval yards around the gas giant Criteus. Its seizure rapidly and with as little damage to its infrastructure as possible would allow the Loyalists a great deal more flexibility in the use of the naval yards, 
as they would be able to utilize the Separatists' own supplies to rearm themselves for a further offensive. Once more, this would be key if an attack against Badab Primaris was to be launched swiftly, before the Tyrant could reorganize his forces. To further ensure a swift conquest, the land element of this invasion would consist of the Exorcist chapters and the Red Scorpions, with a combined total of six companies. Some 600 odd space marines with supporting Imperial Guard elements to be deployed after they had secured an initial landing zone and decapitated all local resistance. The majority of these space marine forces would come from the Exorcist's chapter. They had recently dispatched further companies to the conflict, and Carib Köln had kept them in reserve up until this point, to ensure that they would not be whittled away like so many other formations devoured by this seemingly endless conflict. I'm sure the Red Scorpion's chapter master would have preferred to use the majority of his own troops, but to make sure that the tyrant saw the threats against his borders elsewhere as truly legitimate, the Red Scorpions, the primary loyalist force, needed to show the flag visibly on the outer edges, and preferably as far away from their real target as possible. It would have been an even more convincing charade if Carab Cullen himself was leading the raiding efforts, but that was one honor that he was not ready to give up just yet, and he would assume personal command of the Loyalist forces moving into the Piraeus system, giving him a prime side seat to the first of many disasters to befall this campaign. As the fleet formed up and entered the warp from the Larsa system to travel to Piraeus, one of the ships, an Imperial Navy cruiser, the Spear of Mazoa, immediately suffered a catastrophic Gellerfield malfunction as it slipped into the Immaterium, seeing the entire vessel and all onboard crew simply disappear in a split second, as it and everyone on board was torn from reality and sent hurtling unprotected into hell. Hardly an auspicious start to the journey, but neither was it all that uncommon of an occurrence either, particularly this deep into the autonomous zone. What was worse was when the usually stable route to the Piraeus system suddenly turned treacherous. The Geller fields of several vessels were placed under immense strain as it was clawed at by immaterial forces. Generators overloaded and systems were damaged, with the energy spiraling out of control within the vessel itself, blowing out sensitive equipment and causing yet further feedback damage to ricochet through the vessels. In turn, this also caused the rest of the fleet to begin scattering, to drift apart during the long voyage through the warp. First one ship fell out of formation, then a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, until what was once a fleet was now little more than a random gaggle of individual ships hopefully still heading in more or less the same direction. A hope swiftly dashed when they arrived in the Piraeus system. Carab Cullen's own ship was one of the first to arrive seemingly completely alone. But Fortune had not yet completely abandoned the master of the Red Scorpions, as his fleet slowly but surely began to trickle into the system over the course of the next four to six hours, though they were scattered over in an immense area of space and all cohesion had been completely lost which forced the commander of the expedition to choose between either stealth by sending his ships into the system piecemeal under minimal drive, or to order them all to burn engine to the fullest, hoping to regain some semblance of order before needing to launch their attack upon the industrial planet. 
Carab decided on the latter. He had no real firm intelligence of the system, and only the vaguest inclination as to what could possibly be hiding within it. And it would be far too great of a risk to take with six companies of Astartes to have them coast into system, deprived of mutual assistance. But this need to burn engines to the fullest, and also the fact that the fleet had been dumped on the absolute outermost edges of the system, also meant that any element of surprise had been completely forfeited. And the defenders would have days to ready themselves as the energy signatures of dozens of warships lighting their engines to full would be easily spotted. Knowing something is coming and stopping it is not necessarily the same thing. Cullen had been biding his time for a reason, and the Loyalist force even without the poor unfortunate Spear of Mazoa was a significant formation. It consisted of two battle barges, four strike cruisers, six Imperial Navy cruisers, and the Throne of Blood, a Retribution-class battleship. Besides the Raptorus Rex itself, it was the single most powerful vessel under Carab Cullen's command, capable of brushing aside entire fleets of lesser warships. And in addition to this majestic display of martial might, came also a significant number of smaller escort-class ships, frigates and small navy destroyers, along with a sizable contingent of minesweepers and small scout crafts. The tyrant's love for hunter-killer minefields had been um, discovered much to the loyalists' cost on multiple previous occasions and even a Retribution-class battleship would in all due likelihood take severe damage if it managed to wander unwarned into one of those. And of course, at the end of the flotilla, hanging around the rear echelons for protection, were the troop transports, Imperial Guard regiments, and also a large inquisitorial detachment of stormtroopers both to act as a strategic reserve to exploit any gains made by the Astartes which would form the spearhead, and also to act as a potential garrisoning force, should the system this deep within the tyrant's domain prove uncooperative. As for the secessionist forces, Carab Cullen had not needed to worry, it would appear, as long-range auger scans at full power, after all, there was precious little point in trying to hide now, only detected a dozen or so defense monitors, massive, barely mobile weapons platforms, essentially placed in space to provide long-range gunnery support to light skirmishing fleet formations, which were also present in the form of a couple squadrons of locally produced destroyers of an old and long considered obsolete Pugius class design. In terms of real danger to the fleet, the minefields were a much larger concern, but with the net of sweepers running out ahead of the fleet, they were easily discovered and then either disabled or avoided outright. There was also the concern of a handful of larger defense platforms hanging in orbit around Piraeus V. These could potentially provide quite dangerous long-range fire support to the defense monitors and the Pugius class destroyers. The Tyrant had undoubtedly designed the defense specifically to see off large-scale raiding formations, and for this purpose, they were absolutely adequate. 
often possessed of outdated or barely functional auger equipment, the pirate fleet would have a hard time navigating through the sporadically placed minefields of the outer edges. Then, once they had bypassed them, they would be engaged by a skirmish line of the Pugius class destroyers, supported in turn by the defense monitors and the weapons platforms, providing a quadruple line of defense more than capable of delaying nearly any raiding fleet for a very long time indeed. And should it decide to try and press the issue with an aggressive assault, equally able to inflict serious, potentially outright crippling damage on it. But this potential was entirely reliant upon the fleet outranging and outgunning a sporadic, poorly maintained and organized pirate flotilla against the phalanx of cruisers, battle barges, strike cruisers, and a battleship. That was not going to work out quite as well. Seeing no reason to delay further, Colin gave the order for the fleet to head towards their designated objectives at full speed, ignoring the defense fleet as much as possible. They were unlikely to provide much in the way of any real challenge after all. The fleet did, however, encounter one very unexpected assault. It turned out that the locally destroyed destroyers were also equipped with a surprising array of long-range heavy torpedoes mounted both within and externally on the vessels, allowing them to attack, withdraw, and attack again, firing torpedo salvos well outside of the Loyalist fleet ability to engage effectively. At such extreme ranges, lance batteries and even less so bombardment cannons were simply not able to calculate an effective firing solution against the nimble destroyers and their own torpedoes, even less so. Though, at these kind of ranges, the destroyers too had a very slim chance indeed of actually scoring a strike against the Loyalist flotilla, but when you have the opportunity to do so, always expend ammunition before men, as I like to say. And there was always the possibility that they could get lucky. And if they could continue these torpedo runs with nearly no risk to their own safety, and they were also really impeding the Loyalist fleet's progress, they were constantly forced to take evasive maneuvers and rapid course changes and adjustment in speeds to remain evasive targets, delaying them for several crucial hours. And this was but a taste of the resistance that the Perea system was about to offer up to the Loyalists. Reaching their mission point, the bulk of the Imperial Navy warships, including the battleship Throne of Blood, headed towards Piraeus V, the industrial planet, whilst the majority of the Space Marine strike force diverted to the moon of Cretas Secundus, the location of the large orbital naval facilities orbiting the gas giant. The Imperial Navy's objective was to achieve void superiority above Piraeus V, and potentially also carry out a close-range bombardment against strategic targets, which could then later be exploited by the Adeptus Astartes and the Imperial Guard. But as Vice Admiral Kagawa, commanding the Throne of Blood, later remarked, quote, They fought as if the tyrant's claw was at their necks, and they feared him far more than mere death at the muzzles of our guns, end quote in reference to the desperate near-suicidal defense of the secessionist vessels. Despite being hopelessly outgunned and outarmored, the smaller destroyers and defense monitors continued their assault upon the Imperial Navy, causing disruptions, damages, and delays far beyond what their tonnage would suggest, although in turn they were also obliterated by the massed batteries of the Throne of Blood. And in the end, the Imperial Navy strike force was not able to really complete either of its objectives. 
they were able to close and clear most of the orbital space around Piraeus V, but as they moved in to begin their ground bombardment, hitherto unknown massed macro and defense laser batteries located on the surface in expertly concealed bunker locations opened up in a flurry of violence, las bolts, and massive projectiles hurled up into the sky, taking the Imperial Navy detachment by complete surprise and crippling the Tyrant-class cruiser Gauntlets of Ages outright. Such was the surprise and the ferocity of the bombardment that Vice Admiral Kagawa saw no other option but to order an immediate withdrawal from the orbit of Piraeus V. These defences could not be overcome in a haphazard manner. They would require scouting, surveys, analysis, and a careful approach. However temporary, the defence of Piraeus V had held. Meanwhile, on the moon base, the Loyalists' effort were meeting with more success. Leading the first wave of Space Marines down personally, Carab Cullen made planetfall outside of the lunar base's main citadel. Just as originally planned, the Exorcists and Red Scorpions intended to storm it, decapitating the defenders and ending the battle swiftly, so as to not endanger the dockyards and the vast construction and supply facilities that kept it operational. But as the Red Scorpion's chapter master was rallying his Astartes around him to push on towards the central citadel, they were assaulted from all sides by howling, blood-maddened gangs of what looked like civilians, likely the workers, specialists and administrators of the dockyards themselves, wearing improvised gas masks and wielding weapons that were little more than broken pieces of metal and machinery, they charged towards the invading Astartes, who in return responded by leveling their bolters and unleashing a murderous volley of close-range high-explosive fire tearing apart, blasting open, and shredding hundreds in the first few seconds, then thousands and tens of thousands, and yet they did not pause for even an instant. As the screaming maddened hordes grew ever closer, the Astartes were able to identify the reason why. They were almost all uniformly equipped with small explosive devices attached to their necks and in amongst them stalked a handful of astral claws, slave masters like those seen in the training yards. But instead of chasing hordes of mutant scum ahead of them, they were using the very civilians of the system they had sworn to protect as weapons and shields for themselves. But even in these numbers, the ragtag workers presented little if any real threat to the loyalist Astartes. They were, however, slowing them down, unacceptably so as well. Any realistic hope of seizing the naval yards intact relied on a swift and merciless advance, but due to the fearlessness displayed by the slave warriors of the tyrant, no advance was possible. Even if they could not really hurt the Astartes, their sheer numbers formed a wall stopping them from advancing. Luckily, the rest of the Lunar Station's installations appeared to be more or less as reported by advanced inquisitorial agents. There were little evidence of overt militarization or prepared defenses. The decision was therefore made to bring the Astartes vessels closer into the planet to provide both direct fire support and allow the Thunderhawks and gunships to be deployed directly into the fight, rapidly rearmed and refitted so that they could blast away the screaming hordes with their heavy weaponry, bombs, missiles, and strike capabilities. The effect was immediate and visceral, with entire swaths of charging civilians blasted aside and scattered, vast holes torn in their formations, through which Carib Cullen was just about to order an advance, when the opposition stiffened considerably. Having expended his chaff, Luft Huron, the tyrant of Badab, stepped out onto the lunar surface 
and ordered his astral claws in full chapter strength with armor to charge forth from concealed hangar positions and engage Carab Cullum and his loyalist forces, who swiftly found themselves surrounded by rapidly moving Astral Claw's spearhead, trying to call in for the ships for support and the Thunderhawk gunships. Cullen's vox feed bursts into life with panicked reports, both from the ships now close in orbit and the pilots of the Thunderhawks. Dozens of concealed anti-aircraft, artillery, and missile positions were unveiled all across the surface of the lunar planet, where they rose out of pre-concealed bunkers and started laying into the Loyalist air forces. Thunderhawks were being shot down by the dozens, cometing towards the planet and exploding on impact. And in low orbit, the Exorcist strike cruiser Aleph Argentium was gutted as orbital defense silos opened up right beneath the ship and blasted it open, sending it too in a death spiral slowly down towards the lunar surface as gravity claimed it with his engines dying and sputtering. The Sword of Orodon barely managed to limp away from the lunar surface with his own belly scarred, broken, and torn open, her landing bays and hangars spewing forth flame into the thin upper atmosphere. But the forces on the surface had a precious few seconds to feel bad for their comrades in orbit, as they too were placed under a withering barrage, as basilisk batteries and whirlwinds also rose out of their bunkers to start showering the loyalists with high explosives and missile fire. Craters were being blasted into the moon's surface, even as columns of rhinos, razorbacks, and land raiders rushed to encircle the loyalists. Luft Huron had never been fooled by the raids against the outer edges of the Badab system. He had always known that the strike would fall against Pyrrhus, and against Kritas in particular. He still had plentiful agents and sympathizers within the loyalist ranks, members of the old Carthaginian order who were not at all too fond of the Inquisition's new and heavy-handed way of running the autonomous zone. And though the tyrant may very well be slowly losing his mind, he had lost none of his brilliance. When he had confirmed the loyalist aims, he had undertaken a massive secret and expertly hidden program of building on Kritas and in the system in general. Kritas, as the primary target, was given the most extensive makeover, with several batteries of anti-orbital weaponry being hidden beneath the lunar surface and then surrounded again by additional defenses and anti-aircraft batteries. Further, vast underground spaces to hide a thousand Astartes, plus their armor, their land raiders, rhinos, and razorbacks were also dug into the porous lunar surface. And then finally, it was all expertly camouflaged with the strange, colorful vegetation of that little lunar world. And as the final touch, the cherry on top, Luft Huron had turned the Inquisition against Carab Cullen by feeding their agents patently false information and convincing them it was the truth. The art of pissing on someone and telling them it's raining. But still, the tyrant's trap had not fully closed even as Cullen's vox speed was blurting out an endless stream of disastrous information regarding the situation on Cretus, and the news that the Imperial Navy was retreating from Piraeus V, he also received word of a secessionist armada which ripped its way into real space at the edge of the inner Piraeus system. The only silver lining to be found here was that at least the tyrant's once glorious fleet had been much reduced over the many years of war. 
It was led in by the Astral Claw's sole remaining battle barge, the Seraph of Judgment, that had led their old chapter master to his demise, and in his own way, set all of this in motion. Alongside the Seraph of Judgment were eight other line class vessels, all that remained both of the Astral Claw's remaining naval assets and the Maelstrom Squadron, including an old acquaintance, the Gothic class cruiser Dread Child, so generously donated to the tyrant's cause by the Carthagans seven years prior. And on the topic of prizes, following the nine vessels in was a ragtag force of 60 smaller vessels. Everything from frigates, raiders, destroyers, to converted civilian transports. Carab Cullum had assumed that with the destruction of the secessionist training yards, he had removed the threat of the spear being hurled at his back once he initiated the offensive. It was a grave error indeed for him to not have considered that the tyrant might have more than one spear. Though, if this ragtag force had been further reinforced with the strike cruiser Hyrcania, another company of Astral Claws, including dozens more vessels from the training yards, plus the reinforcements of mutants militia members, the situation may very well have looked even grimmer. Old comfort that, though, to Cullen, as whirlwind rockets exploded all around him. And then, his Vox speed grew silent, as a final blanket of mass Vox distortion laid itself down upon the battlefield, closing the tyrant's trap. Vice Admiral Kakawa, now having lost all communication with the Red Scorpion's chapter master, and having seen the incoming forces of the tyrant, was damned happy that he had ordered the retreat from Piraeus V as early as he had. If he had still found himself engaged with planetary defences now, he would have been caught and slaughtered before he would have had any chance to withdraw. The seemingly suicidal actions of the system's defence boats now made a lot more sense. They were all just buying time for the trap to close, and they had very nearly succeeded. Though even in this relatively good position, Kagawa quickly realized that if the tyrant's fleet could fall upon his vessels alone, he would stand precious little chance. He possessed superior firepower with the Throne of Blood, but it would be swiftly outnumbered, and the Guard Emperor alone knew how many other Astral Claws might still be stationed aboard the Seraph of Judgment. If they began to run rampant through his ship, the firepower of a battleship would matter for absolutely nothing, with its command center awash with the blood of its officers. Instead, he reckoned the only chance the Loyalists would have now was a swift retreat and an attempt to meet up with the Astartes' vessels. The only problem was, technically speaking, Vice Admiral Kagawa had no authority with which to order the Space Marines around. And without direct links to Karab Cullen, he had to rely upon their authority. He could not order them, he could not coerce them, and so instead he tried to negotiate with them. Quickly outlaying a plan, he dispatched it over to the Exorcist's Master of Fleet, one White Rider, who was now the ranking individual amongst the Astartes. Outlying a plan, both fleets would withdraw immediately to reorganize and then try to face the secessionists on more immediately equal terms. This might, however, lead to severe damage both the transport ships and the forces still engage upon the lunar surface, as they would now suddenly be bereft of all void support, including the Thunderhawks and any way to retreat. 
if the Loyalists were defeated or kept away from the planet by the Secessionist Armada, Carib Cullen and nigh on 600 Astartes would be wiped out in a day. As much as he hated it, however, the Exorcist's Master of Fleet saw no other alternative and so agreed with Kagawa's plan and orders his vessels to leave orbit and halt support of Cullen's forces on the moon. Seeing this, the secessionists immediately set after the fleeing loyalists. But their lack of training, general inexperience of their captains, and vastly different capabilities soon became a problem. The smaller raider class vessels began to streak ahead of the rest of the fleet, even as the slower converted frigates and transports began falling behind. The Armada's formation broke itself apart into a lengthy line. Though the Loyalists' immediate and rapid retreat had also left them exposed as well. Kagawa had ordered all of his fighting vessels to take priority, leaving the slower transports at the rear vulnerable to the quicker raiders. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Imperial Guard troops were incinerated along with their transports, destroyed by enemy raiders without even knowing that they were in battle. Seeing this, the Gauntlet of Ages, having already been crippled by ground fire from the planet, turned in to the approaching enemy fleet. Knowing that it could not run, it chose instead to sell its life as dearly as possible, specifically targeting several large but slow vessels that were identified as fire ships. Previous transports, now with a skeleton crew, and packed full of volatile explosives. The Gauntlets of Ages, firing all guns, sneaking out against the raiders, rammed into the first and then a second of these fire ships reducing much of her hull into molten slag. Though the decrepit corpse of the ship still continued firing all the way up until the Seraph of Judgment closed in at point blank range and hammered her main lance battery straight through the molten wreck of the ship, finally touching off her plasma generators and reducing it to stardust. The Gauntlet of Ages had achieved its objective. It had saved hundreds of thousands of Imperial Guard lives, and it had bought the Loyalist fleet time, as well as destroying two fire ships. A better end could hardly be imagined. With the Loyalist forces in full, if temporary, retreat in the void above, down on Cretus. The Loyalist Astartes, now suddenly outnumbered, were falling back, forming defensive circles to try and hold off the approaching Astral Claws, who hammered into them from all sides, whilst herding yet further and fresh hordes of slave soldiers straight into the firing line. Not even caring for their lives, the claws simply shot straight through them, using them as nothing more than meat shields to absorb the enemy's bullets and ammunition. As they were being overwhelmed on all sides, Carab Cullen, with Severin Loth, his chief librarian at his side, reorganized his area of the battlefield and began falling back to a series of towered structures nearby. These would be their center for resistance and a place where they could potentially organize and launch a counter-attack. Outnumbered by well over 400 Space Marines, they would have to bide their time now before trying to retaliate. But the Astral Claws for once had the advantage in armor, and they were using it relentlessly to hack away at the Loyalist forces even as they tried to withdraw. 
the tyrant himself led an armored spearhead straight into the heart of the loyalist forces before disembarking from the assault ramp of his land raider, leading his personal guard in a charge towards the heart of the loyalist defenses, where Carahab Cullen stood tall, firing his storm bolt into the throng below. Seeing this, the highest ranking exorcist captain on the planet, Silas Albrecht, a captain and commander of the first company, moved to intercept the tyrant who was burning and slashing and cutting a bloody swathe through the loyalist forces. Dressed in terminated armor and leading his own elite forward, he intended to slay the tyrant before he reached the Lord of the Red Scorpions. But it was not the tyrant of Badab that would be Silas Alvarek and his Enochian guard's opponent today. It would instead be a member of the tyrant's retinue, ancient Claytor, the infamous astral claws Dreadnought, whom slammed into the Enochian guard like a thunderbolt, scattering them and engaging Silas Alvarek in a one-on-one -on -one fight, monster versus terminator-clad captain. The captain of the Exorcist was badly bruised and broken by the Astral Claws Dreadnought, which crushed his terminator armor in its power fists. Any lesser armored battle brother would have died right then and there, squashed to a pulp. But the Terminator armor provided him with just enough time to swing down his relic mace and strike the joints of the dreadnought adamantine armed knees and motive system, bringing it to a grinding halt. At the cost of several of their members' lives, the Enochian guard and the captain had stopped the Astral Claw's dreadnought, though the captain would be taking no further part in the battle leaving Luft, Huron, and Carab Cullen to have their duel. The two hammered into one another with a crash of ceramite that could be heard across the entire battlefield, even through the din of the fighting. Both were protected by the finest Terminator armor their chapters could provide. Carab Cullen wielding the Blade of the Scorpion, the relic weapon of the chapter masters of the Red Scorpions, and Luft Huron, the claw of the tyrant, which swiftly proved itself perhaps the superior weapon in this engagement, and may be a sign of other things to come as well, as whilst it cut through the terminator plates of Carab Cullen with disgusting ease, the wounds the grazers on his flesh would not close despite his Astartes metabolism. They kept bleeding freely, spilling out over his battle plate whilst the wounds he scored in return on the tyrant seemed to not bother the master of Badab one bit. As they traded blows faster than the eye could follow, Cullen was falling back. He was being pushed back. This was not an opponent he could beat. The very least not, without a little bit of cunning. Stepping away from another wild swing from the tyrant's claw, he uttered a string of curses, calling Huron a traitor, a cur, a petty false king who had failed to protect his kingdom and driven the astral claws to heresy. Roaring his anger at this, the tyrant stepped in with another huge swing to tear Cullen in half. Expecting the frenzied strike, the master of the Red Scorpion stepped just out of the path and thrust his sword, two-handed, straight into the tyrant's side, seeking it to drive it straight through his body. Whilst the pain would have crippled even an Astartes in mere moments, the tyrant once more seemed to not even feel the blow and instead spun on his own heel, ripping the sword free from his back and swinging out the claw of the tyrant, burying it deep into Carab Cullen's chest and tightening the claws around his heart. Sensing death mere moments away, Cullen threw himself back, tearing the claw from his own chest in doing so, but just barely saving himself. 
the tyrant's claw closing on empty air where it should have crushed two hearts. And before he could make a second attempt, Severin Loth and the rest of Carab Collins' honor guard interposed themselves between the two fighters, and Power Arm and Hangs reached down to grab Collins' armor and drag him away from the fight. The one-on-one -on -one showdown goes to Luft Huron, and with it, the Astral Claws pushed in ever more ferociously into the Loyalists, who could now seemingly do nothing but fall back into ever tighter circles to be slaughtered piecemeal by the victorious Astral Claws. But then, a new sun appeared in the sky above. The Redeemer, the Exorcist's battle barge, its void shields at full capacity, was streaking into the upper atmosphere of the moon, its void shields lighting up as it continued to desperately try and keep the ship intact from the tearing forces of gravity, illuminating the whole battlefield and kicking up a storm of dust, fire and debris. Even as the gun batteries began to reach out and hammer away at the void shields, hordes and hordes of Thunderhawk gunships descended down to the surface, launching strafing runs even as the massive bombardment cannons of the Redeemer fired at point blank range. Undoubtedly catching both loyalists and secessionists in its fire, but it did force the Astral Claws to withdraw into their bunkers. Artillery barrages would continue, heavy weapons fire would streak out and shoot down scores more Thunderhawk gunships, but despite the appalling costs, the rest of the loyalist forces were finally withdrawn as the Redeemer, engine straining well beyond tolerance, has finally managed to drag the ship out of the atmosphere and back into the void. Its engines near crippled, its weapon batteries alight from stem to stern. She would require years in dock before fighting again, but she did manage to escape. Unlike the ground war, the void battle had gone in the loyalists' favor, much due to the lacking qualities of the secessionists' remaining naval forces. Admiral Kagawa had outmaneuvered them in their first pass, and managed to bring all of his broadside firepower and his superiority in heavy vessels to bear against the piecemeal advance of the secessionists smashing, slicing, and burning apart their hordes of smaller, weaker ships, he was able to crush the most significant portion of the enemy's vanguard, before both fleets turned around and exchanged point-blank volleys with one another, broadside to broadside as they passed. The Dreadchild, finally being put down, spiralling out of control, wreathed in fire after one of these. Another of the secessionists' invaluable line ships was broken in half by the God Slayer, an exorcist's strike cruiser which rammed the Thoughts Hound amidship, breaking the ship's back and destroying her utterly, at the cost of near crippling the God Slayer in return. Having now lost two of their main fighting vessels, the Seraph of Judgment flew into the midst of the battle, blasting loose broadsides at all sides. Many loyalist ships as well were crippled and falling back, but the Throne of Blood, the mighty battleship itself, moved in towards the Seraph on Judgment on an apparent ramming course, a consequence that I would see even both ships reduced to dust and ruin. But just before impacting, as the Seraph turned to fire one last devastating broadside straight into the Throne of Blood's bow, the battleship unleashed a point-blank salvo of melter torpedoes, which could not miss. 
Even as the lance batteries of the Seraph hammered into, scorched through and blasted open the throne's prow, the murder torpedoes buried into the battle barge's critical internal structures, finding the plasma engines and detonating. The mighty ancient battle barge of the Astral Claws simply disappeared. But the throne had not gotten out of it all that much more cheaply. The detonation of a battle barge at point blank range, plus the fact that most of its prow armor had been torn away by the Seraph mere moments before, saw the entire front of the battleship turned into a wreck of molten slag, hissing and fizzing in the cold void. The throne of blood might never fight again. But with the destruction of the Seraph, the remainder of the secessionist naval elements began to break apart and scatter through the system. The handful of remnants of smaller ships or slower ships or those who had not been able to escape were brought to bear, hammered into wrecks by the loyalist ships or boarded by the remaining exorcists and red scorpions. It had been a prohibitively costly battle for the loyalists, but this was all the secessionists had left. And as with so many engagements previously, the Loyalists could afford even the most disastrous of losses. The Secessionists could not. And with the Redeemer carrying out its insane rescue operation, the landing forces were also brought out of harm's way, with nearly three Fifths being rescued, although many of those in turn as well were the honored dead, brought back aboard to keep them out of the grasping hands of the Astral Claws and their desecrating ways. Although the official numbers are not mentioned, Garab Cullen Strike Force of Astartes, six full companies. I would be surprised if even three remained. Several hundred of the God Emperor's finest warriors killed in just a couple of hours. It had been a titanic conflict. With the Loyalists withdrawing from the system, the Secessionists were the technical victors. The Prius system remained in their hands, but they had gambled their entire fleet, and they had lost it. Never again would they be able to truly challenge the Loyalists in the Void, and so the Prius system was practically lost to them, as the Loyalists could return later and simply bombard the planets into rubble and dust. The battle ended with Lufthuron eventually ordering a withdrawal from the Prius system, having lost again his void assets. The only planet he could now hope to retain control over was the Badab system itself, focused on Badab Primaris and its surrounding planets, whilst the rest of the outlying systems making up the Badab sector would now all be lost. On Carib Cullen's side, however, recovering from his grievous near-mortal wounds, he had lost a significant portion of his fleet. He had suffered devastating attrition to the Exorcists and his own Red Scorpions. And he had also not been able to launch a rapid advance towards Padab Primaris. Huron would be given all the time he needed to consolidate his remaining forces on Badab itself. Both sides had gambled and both sides had lost. The tyrant had thrown the dice hoping to decapitate the loyalists, to kill hundreds of space marines and annihilate a vast, powerful fleet formation it would probably take years to replace. 
He had killed many loyalist Astartes. He had near mortally wounded Carab Cullen, and he had mauled their fleet. But in return, he had lost his own navy as well. The losses suffered in the ground war were less important to him. He had held the advantage, and he had undoubtedly inflicted far more casualties than he had suffered. And I am sure he took a great deal of personal satisfaction as well in laying low his arch enemy in the war. As for Cullen, he had gambled that he could seize the Prius system and forge on to Badab Primaries and end the war quickly, with a minimum of bloodshed by denying the tyrant the reinforcements scattered throughout the sector. In this, he too had failed. He had expended the lives of hundreds of Astartes. His fleet, although faring better than the secessionist one, had lost several mighty warships, and those who remained were all heavily damaged or outright crippled. As a fighting force, it was essentially done. But unlike the tyrant, he had reserves, though none nearby enough to intervene and stop the tyrant from evacuating his forces. And so, the most expensive battle of them all, the battle for Badab Primaris, was unfortunately still ahead of the Loyalists. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.